Good evening and welcome to Face to Face, the show where we talk with local broadcasters here in South Dakota. We always talk about news and weather and sports here on the show. And today we're talking with someone who's been in the business for quite a while. He works in the sports department at KDLT. Today we're talking with Mark Oven. And Mark, thank you so much for being here today on the show. Pleasure to be here. What was your, what was your first job in, uh, in the sports department? Uh, first TV job was when I was in college in Richmond, Virginia, um, at the, the South's first television station, WTVR. <laughs> I, was, uh, I just went down to the station while I was in school and basically said, guys need anybody to hang out here and just like do whatever <laughs> and they I think I think I started off like three hours a week or six hours a week doing production type things I typed in CGs and scores I cleaned slides uh, <laughs> that was back in the day where we ran film and had slides you know when you see us on TV and there's a little uh, face over your shoulder those were actually slides that oh, were run wow. through a slide chain so every, every show, you had to get in with these white gloves and you had to clean the slides off so there were no smudges. There's a big smudge on that slide, there'd be a big <laughs> smudge on that face over your shoulder. Wow. So, uh, <clears throat> and I made a lot of beat calls to all the different uh, uh, police departments throughout the entire area. And Rich Richmond was about the 50th market TV-wise at that oh, time. Oh, it's really big. So, and within, I don't know, it was about nine months, um, they decided to add a weekend sports cast uh, to, to what they were doing and they encouraged me to try out for it and I was quite frankly not prepared to do that. <laughs> I really didn't think that uh, it was very smart of them to stick some, co I was still in college at the time, to even take a chance with a college kid because normally in a major market like that they hire people who have had years of experience to even do a weekend sports thing. And They hired me and stuck me on the air my senior year in college. I was actually doing the sports in a very large market. So when I graduated from college, I had done real TV for a year in addition to the P, you know, the production type things, and it made it very easy to get a job uh, somewhere else full time when I got out of school. So that's how I got started was just going down, and that's the opportunity that that all of your classmates have here, and you know, at the stations here in Sioux Falls, we've most of those production type jobs are usually high school kids who can you know, apply for the jobs and you get foot in the door and you never know. I've seen a lot of a lot of kids that just start off running like the camera that's on back here end up shooting news and becoming a reporter and next thing you know they're on the air and who knows. But wow. if you're willing to kind of roll your sleeves up and get in there and do it, sometimes it leads to good things. When did you first get the interest to do television? Um, did you get it in, in high school or, or earlier than that? Hard to say, my, my next door neighbor when I was born was Kurt Gowdy. That is a name that probably doesn't mean anything to you because this was a long time ago, but Kurt Gowdy was the, he was the voice of AFL football and Major League Baseball on network TV. Wow. And at the time when I was born in Boston, he was voice of the Boston Red Sox and was my, my next door neighbor. My dad was in radio in Boston for 50 years but not a sports guy at all. So my interest for this had nothing to do with my dad being in radio. My interest to get into TV was strictly because of sports. That's what I wanted to do. I, I've never wanted to be Have you, a you news guy or I would never want to be a weather guy. I <laughs> love doing the sports because I'm a, a sports fan and it's well, kind of well, cool well, to get paid for being a sports fan. Did you play sports when you were in uh, high school? I played, I played everything there was to play as a kid growing up. When people ask me what my favorite sport is, they're I'm lucky enough to like them all. And so you really have that sportsman's blood in you oh yeah. to you know, keep going. Um, mm -hmm. Where did you go to college? University of Richmond in Virginia, which is uh, not known as a communication school. It, I, I got a journalism major, which I think is important to anybody that wants to get in communications. You know, have to know how to write and put stories together so that they they make sense and they're, they're well versed and so that was pretty helpful to me. What it did though, when I was in college before I get into TV, I was sports editor of our college newspaper and I found out in a hurry I hated that. Really? I, I, I much prefer to talk and tell stories and show pictures and show stories, and tell stories with video than to write it. And that was back in the days when you literally had to cut and paste everything. I mean today yeah. electronically it's a whole lot easier than it was back then where you had to write your stories, had 
maybe six people on the staff writing their stories, and it was up to me to go back and put, you know, literally cut and paste and spray glue on the back and have it all fit onto a page and yeah. a half of our collegian newspaper. And I, I guess I just didn't like that too much. I liked writing stories, but I didn't like putting just, it all just together. Just the print copy. Yeah. yeah. I love putting together a sports cast every day. Same thing. It's, a jig, it's a, like a jigsaw puzzle where you're putting together. I get four minutes for sports, for example, at 6 o'clock. And it's up to me to put these different sized pieces and hunks together to fit into four minutes and to try to make it as diverse and interesting as possible. And like yesterday, for example, we had stories on the Snow Fox swim team, on the Stampede, the Sky Force, the Canaries baseball team, um, All-State basketball, the Storm, indoor football. You, know, you can combine all those different elements into one little sports cast. Hopefully you've made it interesting for somebody because everybody has usually an interest in one of those things more than, than the, the rest. Yeah. When, when did you come uh, here to South Dakota? 1978. So I've been here for 23 years, and this has really changed. I, I did uh, a f help with a, a chamber function here um, several days ago where they asked me to interview the five different main teams in Sioux Falls, as in pro teams, mm -hmm. and what impact they've had on the economy and the entertainment value in Sioux Falls. Of course, the soccer team hasn't quite started yet. They start next month, the Spitfire. But that'll have high school kids from the good players from Lincoln and Washington, O'Gorman, Roosevelt, who have gone on maybe to play college soccer. They're going to get to play in this, this new league that they're in. Um, there's the Sky Force were the first team to come along, and that was 1989. So I've been here 11 years, and there was no such thing as pro sports. Uh, so what we had the North Central Conference and all the high school activities, which was great. That was plenty enough to cover. But now there's five teams. There were five people on this panel Jeez. that I did. And you think about it, you know, one hasn't started yet, but the other four have been incredibly uh, well-received and successful, at least in terms of a fan base and numbers of people that attend their events and buy their stuff. And there's the Canaries in baseball, and they're the ones that haven't quite had that great year yet. They think this is going to be their year. But they've still been around uh, eight or nine years now without having won a game, you know, without having won a title or even made the playoffs. Uh, the Indoor Football League really went well last year in its first year, and the Stampede have just done fabulous. You know, it helps that they've won, but it also helps, I would think, probably, and I don't know how many of them go to Lincoln. I know several of them go to Roosevelt, the kids that are on those teams. They're high school kids. A lot of them are high school kids, and it's fun to go watch these high school kids that aren't getting paid a penny to go do something they love doing um, because they want to play at the next level someday. They want to get a scholarship in college, or they want to play. they, they got a kid on the Stampede team right now, I can tell you. Thomas Vanek, he'll be in the NHL someday. What's something you've seen as, as a change throughout your years working in uh, sports? That here, that, the... the the evolution of these professional teams, uh, and I wondered whether that would work here because you know we only have 120. What did you people. cover in like your early your uh, early years, in, like the late 70s, early 80s? You covered high school, predominantly high school stuff and college stuff, and that was it. Now I shouldn't say that was it because <clears throat> in Sioux Falls we consider the Minneapolis teams all our team. Mm -hmm. I consider them local sports. Um, you very rarely are going to see national stuff on my sports cast. Very rarely. You'll see, you know, the Daytona 500 or the U.S. Open in tennis or the Masters in golf. Yeah, you'll see those main things or the World Series or the, you know, every Sunday you'll have highlights from the NFL. But you can get all that. That's what's changed. You can get all that on cable. You can get all that on ESPN, CNN, SI, and Fox News. There's a just, they've become so many sources for you if you're a major sports fan to get your information. When I first came here, I used to have to try to combine all that into my show because there wasn't any of that. There were no, there, cable TV hadn't become what it is mm -hmm. today. There were no sports networks. So I had to try and cover local and national in my sports cast. And now it's made it far more enjoyable because now my whole sports cast can be local. I still consider the Twins and the Vikings and the Wild and the Timberwolves and those teams local 
because that's where the interest lies for people that live in Sioux Falls. And I say Sioux Falls, I'm talking South Dakota. Mm -hmm. But now you've got teams like the Sky Force and the Stampede and the, the Storm and the Canaries that have sort of taken that, that uh, need to go cover those Minneapolis teams quite as strongly away because now we have our pro teams here, right here, and there are teams, and the people are following those teams, so um, it really truly becomes uh, almost entirely a local sports cast. And that's just my philosophy. Mm -hmm. I don't know what anybody else chooses to do with it. But there's so much information there to fit into a three or four minute sports cast. You got to draw the line somewhere, and it's sometimes hard to get to those things. Uh, we've got a lot of local kits that have now gone on to make it in big time sports. Becky Hammond in the WNBA is, she is just, I knew she was good when I first saw her play <laughs> at Rap City Stevens when she was a high school kid, because she played like Pete Maravich, dribbling behind her back and throwing them over her head, and they'd go off the backboard and in, doing stuff that most basketball players in the state weren't doing, wow. male or female you knew she was special and she's going to be one of the stars in the WNBA that makes that makes the WNBA become a local thing because people want to see how a South Dakota kids do it kind of just like how the Orlando Magic is now Same part of the local scene Mike because Miller. Mike Miller's on it exactly um, I if I had run Orlando Magic scores before last fall because I don't run all the NBA scores I figure if you care enough which I do as a sports fan being a Bostonian I want to see how the Celtics did but I can't fit all that in my show. So I'll go home and watch ESPN when I'm done with my night's work to find out how my teams did. I would never have run the Orlando Magic scores until this year. But I, and I don't run the Magic scores so much for the Magic score. I run them so you'll see how, you'll never see Orlando Magic, like last night, Orlando Magic 108, uh, Boston Celtics 101. You'll see how many points Mike Miller got. Because I don't think any of us really care how Orlando did so much. We care how Mike did, mm -hmm. which justified a trip that I took down to Florida that I've gone every, each last three years to do a bunch of interviews with Mike Miller. And, and this year, it wasn't even so much the interviews with Mike Miller, which were interesting because now he's a pro. But what was fun about that was talking to Grant Hill and Tracy McGrady and all of his teammates. It's more fun for me to hear how his teammates feel about how he's doing than it was to even talk to Mike, because I've, I've known Mike since he was a little kid. And yeah, it was fun to see how he's doing and to go to his house and play pool with him and all those kind of things and see where he lives and go to a Magic game and see this South Dakota kid <coughs> wearing number 50 and playing for the Orlando Magic. And four of their cheerleaders had on Mike Miller shirt. <laughs> you know you've made it. <laughs> when four beautiful women have your name on the back of a jersey and they're cheering for you. I mean, that, that was pretty cool to see where Mike has gotten. But it was cooler for me to talk to these established NBA guys and find out their take on Mike Miller. Have you uh, met anyone else uh, from the national circuit? Have you interviewed any other uh, oh, national sports stars? Over the years, tons of them over the years, yeah. Um, in covering the Vikings for example you know you go to these big time events you go to the, the NFC championship game a couple of years ago you you're on the sidelines with uh, people that are just there at at that event to, to watch the event Evander Holyfield was right there on the sideline you know watching the game it it uh, you run into people all kinds of people over the years you meet them or you run into them or whatever and you find out they're just regular people they really are it's just that I think the general public tends to put athletes up on a pedestal and make them into something bigger and better than they should be for the most part. It's the athletes that live life the way they should that I put up on a pedestal, and there's very few of those. The Josh Heupels, who's from Aberdeen, whose team won the national championship in football. <coughs> He's a wonderful human being. He lives life the way it's supposed to be lived. He's a, he, he's a Christian kid who lives his life with those morals and values and knows that football's fleeting. It's not going to be there forever. It's who you are as a person that makes you uh, a valuable member of our society. And Josh is, he realizes he has a platform here to maybe uh, share some things while he is on that pedestal that people have put him on, mm -hmm. as opposed to letting all this fame and glory go to his head. He hasn't done that at all. 
And so people like that have made far more of an impression on me than some of these big name stars that you might go, wow, you got to meet him? Uh, to me, the, the people that have made the biggest impression are the people, I, and there are some big name people that I would throw in that same category for you too. What's been one of the more interesting stories you've covered in sports? Boy, that's, that's a hard one to say. One. Is there one that kind of sticks out in your mind as one story of the more that memorable I ones? I, I, I would say some of the stories that I've covered that have had the uh, biggest impact on my life weren't even necessarily sports stories. Um, I've lived here long enough and, and gotten involved in the community in various ways enough to where um, <coughs> some of the people that I've gotten to be best friends with aren't necessarily even sports figures. And probably one of the most uh, memorable events, stories that happened that, that seems like yesterday to me was when the governor's plane crashed several years ago. Really? And there were several of my friends on that plane oh my. that were in charge of, I mean, the president of a bank, the uh, head of economic development for the state, Governor Mickelson. Um, probably out of the people on that plane, all but two or three I was pretty good friends with. And that was just, just a tragic day. I'll always remember that day because as the day wore on and we found out more information about what had happened that day, it just became, it went from being a story to me to being something very personal. And I'm sure it did for a lot of people in the whole state. But to be, even though I was a sports guy, I sort of just put aside what I was doing and tried to help the newsroom gather details yeah. and it became a gut-wrenching thing. I also had a, another s deal where one of my best friends, um, lifelong friends, uh, who was covering what had been the lead story on World News Tonight for Peter Jennings when I was at KSFY years ago, which was an ABC station, he was covering the meatpacking strike in Austin, Minnesota. And those were some pretty violent days back in the mid-80s where uh, Morell's had a lot of that going on too, where there were, um, there were strikes, there, were, uh, there, was, there was some physical violence going on at these plants where there were picketers and it got pretty nasty. And Joe Spencer was his name, was covering this meatpacking strike at Hormel in Austin. And it was the lead story on World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. And that was back before we had the, the satellite opportunities that we have today where, you know, even local stations have satellite trucks. Yeah. You can go anywhere. Back then there were like a few places that you could satellite stuff from. Joe was in Austin that day um, covering the meatpacking strike and had to get his story up to uh, Minneapolis to edit the story and satellite it back to Chicago so it could be the lead story that night. And it was a pea soup foggy day and he was planning to, f to fly yeah. from Austin up to Minneapolis. Airports were closed. They wouldn't allow any planes to be in the air. It was way too dangerous. Well, in the news business, we all put, and I, I've learned from this, uh, we all put this deadline ahead of everything. That y you sort of think you're infallible, that nothing can go wrong. If I'm covering the news, I can, I can do it. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. I've driven way faster than I should have driven in snowstorms to get back with highlights. And I, to this day, wonder why I did it. Because, you know, it really wasn't that important. But that's because Joe hired an airline or a uh, helicopter pilot, paid him under the table to fly below the radar, and they clipped some wires and crashed and were killed. Oh, my. He was covering the lead story that night. He became hey, the lead Lynch. story that night. And... That was probably the other, you know, for me, those are very personal days that I'll always remember is probably things that had a dramatic impact on my life as much as anything else. And having to go on the air and do the sports cast that night was just uh, both times. But, but you have to do that. You mm -hmm. have to let whatever's going on in your personal life stay over here somewhere. And, and it's hard to do sometimes, you know, when you're on the verge of crying, it's hard to do. But you have to put it aside and go on the air. And I remember both times, especially when Joe was killed, 
the news director was very compassionate. He says, if you want to go home, that's fine. We understand. I said, no, I, I'll, I'll do it. And I thought it was okay. And then at the very end of World News Tonight, uh, I, I avoided watching any of what they did. So I, it was right before we went on the air. I didn't need that then. At the very end of the show, Peter Jennings came back and gave a little eulogy for Joe. And I was out on the set because in those days we had all four of us on the set live for the open of the show. So I was sitting there and had to hear that. Mm -hmm. So I found myself, get, uh, that was hard because I it brought up all those emotions all over again and I had to go and get myself back together. But it changed the way I felt about being stupid in terms of getting, trying to get stuff back at any cost. And uh, we, when we were coming back from the NFC title game two years ago, I was talking about in Minneapolis when the Vikings lost that game that they should have won. Everyone remembers that that's a Viking fan. Uh, when, when Gary Anderson missed the field goal at the yeah. end of the game and only one he missed all year. And by the way, I found myself, um, Gary Anderson's a class guy. I really like that guy. And he's coming to Sioux Falls this summer for a camp which is neat, because he's one of those guys I'll place on a pedestal. When that game was over, I felt guilty, because before the game, I walked over to him and said hi, and we'd gotten to know each other a little bit through covering the Vikings, and he's from Penn State, and I'm from the East Coast, and we talk soccer and this and that, and developed a little bit of a friendship, and I walked over before the game, and I said, <laughs> I'll forget this. Hope it doesn't come down to a game-winning field goal, because oh. you know, I don't think it will, because you guys you know, you'll kick their butt. Oh. And when the game got over, I thought, uh-oh, I wonder if that was my fault. <laughs> you know, I'm one of these people that believes in, I'm very superstitious, I'm thinking, uh, I, I put the whammy on him, <laughs> you know. But on the way back from that game, we ran into a whiteout. Oh, my. And we had probably an hour to spare had we driven all the way back from the Metrodome to get back, get stuff edited, and get it on the air that night. We ran into a whiteout near Worthington that was so bad that uh, Trevor Peterson was with me. The two of us were in the car, and he was leaning out one side, and I was leaning. We were going five miles an hour in the interstate, and you could not see 10 feet in front of you. It was scary. Jeez. And suddenly I started thinking about Joe. I kept going five miles an hour for a while, and I was looking at my watch going, okay, if we get through this, and then suddenly it clears up, we can still make it back in time. And as we progressed slowly and slowly, it was like, if we don't get out of this in the next 10 minutes, we can't make it. Finally, I just looked at him. I said, you know what? We're pulling over in Worthington. We're going to spend the night here. We're not risking our lives to get this stuff on the air tonight because it mm -hmm. isn't worth it. No one's going to care if we die in an accident, aside from my kids and family. A, f a month later, people always go, oh, that was too bad. Those guys died trying to get a story mm -hmm. on it. Think about how silly that. I, I was always so mad at Joe for placing, getting that story on ahead of, all the things he had ahead in his life. He had just gotten married, and um, I was so happy for him. And he put his job ahead of, he risked his life for his job. And Jeez. in that whiteout, I find myself going, not going to do it. So we actually did a, a live deal during the sportscast. I did a report and had them roll highlights on a cell phone from the car. <sighs> on where wow. <laughs> we did a little deal. I think we did a little thing at the upper part of the news just saying, you know, uh, the, the weather guy came to us and I said, yep, it's bad out here. You can't go 10 feet without, you know, not seeing where you're going. So don't come out and drive in this stuff. It's terrible. We got a few minutes left. I wanted to ask you your opinion on the new XFL. Do you think it's going to last long or? Nope. Not at all? Nope. Why is that? Well, ratings kind of drive things. Uh, the first week that it was on, the ratings were fabulous. Now they're to the point where it's almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. I, I for sure don't think NBC will stay involved with it. I, I don't see how they can because NBC is a TV network that back this and it's not working. You have to realize that something is a mistake. And look at TV shows get canceled all the time. To me, the XFL was a TV show. It, it wasn't a football league. It was a TV show. Now. It might make it as a, f if they completely retool it and make it into a football league, yes, it might. <coughs> they got to decide what they want it to be. I, I, I think they either want it to be the kind of entertainment you get at WWF or they want it to be a football league. It's got to be one or the other. I think they've, they've, the mistake they've made is diluting both 
to the point where it's like not wild enough for the people thought it that was going to be wild, and the football certainly isn't good enough for those of us who wanted to see good football. So the way it is now won't make it. It might. Vince might just decide to, to really make it absurd here next year, but that's what he's going to have to do probably to make it go. The USFL didn't even make it years ago as an alternative to the NFL, and they went and signed guys like Steve Young and Herschel Walker and Doug Flutie to play in their league. This XFL's got no one of any uh, talent, name recognition at all in talent. You're right. I mean, the, the few guys that are in it. I had this argument with a guy at work last night. And he thinks it's going <laughs> to make it. I said, who have they even got in the league? And he goes, Tommy Maddox. Like, Tommy Maddox didn't even make it in the NFL. He was a backup quarterback in the NFL. So if they start getting some of these premier guys out of college, maybe. But the way it is right now, Avi, I don't think it has a chance. Just quickly, what do you what do you want to do before you retire from sports? I I could retire today and I'd be very fulfilled in the career that I've had broadcasting. I I honestly thought that I probably wouldn't be doing TV anymore once my kids got to the age that they were, you know, in high school and college sports. So I wasn't covering them, and that has been it's worked so far. I I get teased every now and then by people that that uh, say, oh, you cover a little too much Roosevelt there, or <laughs> whatever. But you know, I, I would say that anybody that doesn't know my kids go to school there would never say that. Um, and, and I try to go the other way. I try to be, over the years, I've done Augustana on the radio and never had the USD or state people mad at me. I did USD on the radio for years and never had the Augie or state people mad at me. I've done a lot of things with all the schools and, and so I, I'd like to think people know that when they're watching me, I'm going to be very objective regardless of that. Um, so, so in terms of covering them, it's not that big a deal. But in terms of being at their events, that makes it very tough. And I, I hate, I've never missed a down of any of their games in football. I've managed to be the guy that's there shooting their games. So that's where you may end up getting a little more Roosevelt footage than you'd like, but uh, compromise you have to make if you watch us. <laughs> But I also like to think we do a whole lot better job for Lincoln and Washington, O'Gorman and Pierre and Huron and Watertown and Yankton and Brookings and Freeman and Elkton than the other stations do because I realize how important it is to all the towns. Being a big city person and growing up as a high school kid where high school sports and college sports took back seat and way back seat to major league sports, I think it's cool for those schools to be able to get their highlights on TV and their names on TV and and you know, I know they think it's cool but I think it's cool that they think it's cool because you know you're only a high school kid once you only go through this once and it is a big deal it's a fun part of your life and um, to see yourself on TV every now and then to rush home and see the highlights of the game you were just in that's pretty, pretty cool. nice yeah that's pretty cool yeah. and so I try to keep that in mind that and once in a while you slip up and you maybe sh didn't get to a game you should have or whatever. But, you know, a lot of that is limitation of staff. And I've always had pretty good people helping me out and I've been lucky that way. But uh, I've got absolutely nothing else that I'd rather, that I still want to do that I haven't done. I've covered all the state tournaments for years, met some pretty wonderful friends and met people that have changed my life. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being with us here today on Face to Face. And I thank you for watching us here. I'm Avi Forstein, and from all of us here at OWL TV, 